Je peux le faire. Blessed be God, Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known to come from you, no secrets are hidden. Grant us the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. Welcome to Calvary Church. It's great to be together at the end of this uh, day to worship the Lord. Whether you're joining us in person or whether you're online, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, our preacher this evening is John Thaxton. Some of you had the pleasure of hearing John preach. I think it was about five or six weeks ago. You might recall that John is in a discernment process for ordination in the Episcopal Church. Um, so we're really pleased to have John speak again this evening. I wonder if anyone has a birthday uh, this week. We would love to pray for you. Yes. Today. Today's your birthday. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. Thanks for being here and sharing your birthday with us. There's a few others that I'm aware of. Tomorrow, it's Quinn Wilhelm's birthday. On Monday, John Howard and Susan Wachter. On Wednesday, Derek Brislin and Heather Pierce. Thursday, Jerry Lango. And Orin McGuire turns eight. On Friday, Rusty Powers and Shelby Trailer turns 20. And then on Saturday, we've got a whole raft of 
birthdays. Bob Copeland, Emerson Cummings is 12, and Julia Cummings is 12, twins. Uh, Roseanne Hines, Kirk Quackenbush, Andrew Saunders, and Nanette Shorter. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What about wedding anniversaries? Any couples to pray for? Okay, I know of four this week. Tomorrow, Karen and Ed Yusey are celebrating 23 years. On Tuesday, Robert and Karen Williams, 26 years. On Wednesday, it's Elisa and uh, my anniversary. We'll be celebrating 31 years. And on Thursday, Brigham and Heidi Palmer, 15 years. So let's pray. O oh, gracious and ever-living God, you have created us, male and female, in your image. Look mercifully upon this man and this woman who come to you seeking your blessing and assist them with your grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love they may honor and keep the promises and vows they have made through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your grace. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, bless the Lord. A reading from the book of the prophet Hosea. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should and, and uh, that I should all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo Ruhamah. Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo An Mi, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In, play, in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in saying today's psalm, Psalm 85. You have been gracious to your land, O Lord. You have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people and blotted out all their sins. You have withdrawn all your fury and turned yourself from your wrath. Nation. Restore us then, O God, our Savior. Let your anger depart from us. Will you be displeased with us forever? Will you prolong your anger from age to age? Will you not give us life again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. 
for he is seeking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, and his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his seed. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of, his, of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. You have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hi. Sometimes um, when we gather every Sunday to hear God's word through this ancient text, the meaning is obvious and, and really a homily uh, serves no purpose but to restate the obvious, which is always humbling as a preacher, right? Sometimes though, the text, the distance between the text and our contemporary world is so vast that we really need someone to help bridge the gap. I pray that today God helps us bridge a bit of a gap. Hosea is a prophet in the ancient split kingdoms of Judah to the south and Israel to the north. I don't like calling it Israel because everybody in today's society gets confused and thinks it's like the one thing, right? Um, we'll call it the northern kingdom from here on out. Is that fair? So we have a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. Both of them were led out of Egypt um, with their ancestors. And because of several political issues that went on, these kingdoms split. Now Hosea is mainly targeting or mainly talking to the northern kingdom because it, more than the southern kingdom, had been lured into pursuing a life quite apart from the covenant that God made with the people as a whole. You might remember, uh, I think it was like four weeks ago, or maybe even three, I don't know for sure. My life is confusing since my rib was broken and all that stuff from the uh, McKenna Beach episode. Probably a concussion as well, who knows. But you might remember uh, when I preached last, there was uh, there were some three key, three key characters. We had Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel. Do you remember that? Okay. For those of you who weren't there, let me just give a brief explanation. Um, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel in the northern kingdom created a system that was very, very prosperous for a few. But it was very disenfranchising for the majority. And this system depended upon fertility rights and really abandoning covenant with God in order to pursue relations with neighboring countries, trade treaties, all this other stuff. Does that make sense? Does this sound a little bit contemporary? You get that? All right. So Ahab and Jezebel built this whole system. It became a very prosperous system in the Northern Kingdom. And God sent Elijah to confront them. And you remember the story of Elijah and the 300 prophets of Baal and Elijah having an assassination going after him and fleeing the country and fleeing all the way to the Southern Peninsula of Arabia. Well, much has happened in our story since Elijah. Jehu, 
is the king that followed Ahab. And he, under the instruction of Elisha, I believe, um, killed all of Ahab's family. Not just Ahab, but some 90 of his descendants and servants and households, women, men, men, women, children, right? A very kind of like overkill response to removing Ahab from power. Jehu and the next three kings that followed him in the northern kingdom continued to pursue a life apart from the covenant with God. They were unfaithful to the covenant of God, but God remained faithful. Now, what's important to know about this is Jehu committed this execution in the valley of Jezreel. Is Hosea beginning to make a little bit of sense? Not a little bit, if you're with me. Let's take another step farther. Now we pick up our story. God says to Hosea, I want you to go and marry a woman who you know will be unfaithful to you and bear children that will be unfaithful to you. At that point, I would say, I'm out, God. Find another prophet. Right? Hosea is a little more faithful than I am. And Hosea goes and he marries this woman. And he calls this first child, by God's instruction, Jezreel. Recalling Jehu's excessive violence. The Hebrew is a little bit uh, tricky on this second name. The, the name of the second child is literally no longer pursued with favor, no longer loved. Right? Break it down into English into no longer loved, but it's no longer further pursued with favor. Remember how God has always been pursuing God's people with favor for generation after generation? No longer. The third child is named fully disowned. Can you imagine a family dinner? <laughs> hey, fully disowned, are you gonna do the dishes? Hey, no longer loved. I told you to put out the silverware. Hey, violent one. Can you stop beating on your brothers and sisters? An odd family indeed. God instructs Hosea to serve as a symbol for the religious, social, and political realities of his day. God uses Hosea to accurately name and diagnose what is going on in the world. His nation has broken covenant with God. They no longer walk according to justice and righteousness. It is a violent nation practicing child sacrifice. It's bent on power and excess. And because of this, God will no longer pursue them with favor. God will no longer call them God's own. Now, if you read the entire book of Hosea, the first chapter is the bad news. And then like the next nine to 10 chapters are really going to, into deep detail about all the bad news. But it's bookended with God will yet forgive and redeem. The problem is, is that we, when we look back on this text, we don't pause at the bad news. Good news is good news when we really live with bad news. Right? The good news of being able to walk again is only good news after you have a surgery and can't walk for a while, right? It becomes really good news that you can walk again. How many of you have ever broke an arm or a leg and just have really thought, man, I'm gonna really enjoy that next walk when I can walk again? What's going on here? How do we make sense of a text today read in worship that does such naming of what's going on with the world. It seems a truism that a problem cannot be fixed unless it is named or diagnosed accurately. Whether you are a mechanic, a doctor, a plumber, a teacher, a therapist, administrator, athlete, this truth seems woven into, into the very fabric of reality, that a dysfunction, a problem, an illness must be accurately named in order to fix, heal, deal with, or redeem. And God uses prophets throughout scripture and history to help us name our sin, our failures, our unfaithfulness, and our brokenness. Here's the key. God does not name in order to shame. God does not name in order to shame. God names 
in order to redeem. We have all fallen short. We all miss the mark. It's easy to poke holes at Hosea and the kingdom, but there's a lot of parallels between what's going on in our world and what went on in Hosea's world. The same naming could be done. Many of us carry these histories and memories of the failures of our past very tightly to our chest. We don't want people to know. We don't want to have our failure named. We'd rather just forget about it. But we can't. Something happens, some reminder, some situation brings all the feelings back in the memory of our shame, of our guilt. We feel isolated, exposed, and vulnerable. Fearful that if anyone found out our life, found out about this, our life would be ruined. This is shame. Not that we did bad things, but that we are a bad thing. Not being able to bear this shame, we do mental and spiritual gymnastics to push it way down deep inside. I was going to quote Dr. Phil and say, how is that working for us? But um, I think we all know it, it doesn't work very well. But what if there's an alternative? What if we could name that which brings us shame and know deep down in our bones that God is the God who sees all? He's not surprised by us naming anything. What if we knew deep in our bones that God can accurately name not only what we did, but all the complex subconscious and conscious reasons that we did what we did and name those issues accurately. I mean, I don't even know why I do half the time you know, what I do. And I think that's the truth with most of us. We just aren't aware of how many drives and what the systems and the, the things in our society that cause us to do things that just are not in faithful covenant response to God. God knows all this. We serve a God who accurately names our condition and a God who can redeem everything. Everything. A God who forgives all. A God who frees us from all shame. So that takes care of Hosea. But when I ask the question, what assurance do we have that God is really like that? I think the gospel speaks to this assurance. The disciples are asking Jesus, whose life and ministry, or whose life and ministry was marked by prayer, to teach them how to enter into this kind of relationship that they see him having with God. Teach us to pray, they ask. Teach us to be with God as you are with God. Luke records a bare bones description of the Lord's Prayer. Five extraordinary petitions preceded by one radical claim. Father. That's a radical claim. To be able to name the God of the universe as our Father is a radical claim. We are invited to enter into a relationship with the God of the universe as our parent, our Father. Not a parent like so many parents on earth who fail to be faithful, who are broken, whose own agenda cannot help but sometimes outweigh the good for the child, but the perfect parent who exemplifies all that a parent should be, exceedingly patient, unfathomably wise, unshakably faithful, never a cynic, never petty, never begrudging, never a trickster. The parable that follows the prayer confirms this truth about God. But we may need a little help in closing the distance. You see, Jesus' hearers were not Western individualists like we are. We read the text and we think, uh-oh, the poor host had an unexpected guest and now he has to run out and inconvenience a friend so that the host won't be embarrassed. But that is not how social worship relationships work back then. You see, the whole village was responsible for hosting a guest. The first century here would have been appalled at the shamelessness of the friend who would even consider not getting up and getting bread. How could he bring shame on his village by failing to be hospitable, by being cynical, petty, begrudging? Further, God is not a trickster who switches scorpions for eggs or snakes for fish. What parent among us would do that to our child who is hungry? 
You see, God is not us on our worst days, nor even on our best. God is thoroughly more, more generous, more kind, more loving, more wise, more patient, more just, and more committed to our redemption than we can fathom. The prayer follows, God, hallow your name, make your character known among us. God, bring your rule, your kingdom here among us. God, give us what we need. God, forgive us. God, guide us away from that which destroys. I wonder if the temptation to hold our sin unnamed and unconfessed is a key tool of the enemy to bind us in shame and isolation. I wonder how fear feeds that temptation. You've heard the saying, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I wonder if the Protestant church too quickly dismissed confession in its debate with Rome. The psychological, spiritual cleansing and freedom that comes from naming our sin out loud in a safe, confidential, boundaried space is a rare gift. Though my hope is that hearing the good news from the Gospel and Hosea frees us from our shame and allows us to approach the confession with new confidence and assurance, sometimes we need the gift of a brother, sister, or pastor who speaks out loud so that our ears can hear and our hearts can absorb the truth that we are truly forgiven of blank. You fill in the blank. I just got back from uh, Philmont this morning, the Boy Scout camp down south. And I took a friend down to Philmont. And that friend is the one friend in my life that knows everything about me. Uh, we've been friends longer than we've been married. Not me married to my friend. I'm married to Tanya. But he's a college buddy, and, and we've been uh, friends for over 30 years now. He knew me when I was ornery and doing really stupid things. Uh, he knew me when I was older and doing really stupid things. And he knew me last year and this week as I did really stupid things. My point is, is that my friend is a confidant who will take with him to his grave the things that he knows about me. And I can confess to this Christian friend how I blew it and name out loud my sin. And he can say, John, do you know that God has forgiven you for that? And I'm able to walk away in the confidence, reassured that I'm not hiding anything alone and isolated, but rather, I'm able to say, this is, this is where I really blew it. And my friend can say to me, John, in Christ, you are forgiven. I pray that each of you has a friend like that in your life. I think we all need friends like that. But if you don't, did you know that our church has a framework on page 447 in your prayer book? Did you? It's, a, it's called the rite of penitence or absolution. And did you know that you have a team of clergy here who have an, under oath and under a vow committed their life to hearing a confession in detail and holding that confidentially for it doesn't become a source of gossip in the community? And then they can say, did you know that in Christ you are forgiven even for that? I think if we as a community were able to boldly know that there's nothing that we have done or that we will do that God cannot redeem, if we were able to really get that down in our bones, then I think we could break the cycle of shame in our lives. And we could move forward in a way that was powerful and free. We have a society that binds us in shame 
And I would that God would free us all as a church from that shame. So, there's two options. Find a really good friend, or talk to one of the clergy here, and use the prayer of absolution and reconciliation of the penitent. One thing that I think is really fascinating about when we work through the text together, does Hosea make sense now? You see how it's good news? You see how it describes the reality of brokenness and sin in our world that is as true 3,000 years ago as it is today? It's a very active word. And do you see how God is not like our parents or like we are as parents, but is exceedingly more and is able to redeem anything that happens in our world? That is good news. We can join our voice with the psalmist that you just read. Verse 9 in your psalm, you can look at your worship bulletin. Truly his salvation is very near to those who, who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will increase its yield. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? I, before we um, declare our faith in the words of the Creed, I want to just affirm John's invitation. If anybody would like to seek um, that, that private confidential confession, then myself or any of the other pastors here at Calvary would be happy to meet with you. And then also tonight, after I introduce the confession, let's hold a, a, a longer time of silence than we typically would and then I'll lead us into those words of confession. But for now, let us declare our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made a man. For our sake he was crucified and the conscious Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For our Bishop Kim, and for the priesthood of all believers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For our President, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city of golden, 
for every city and community, and for those who live in them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we end, may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of saints, let us commend ourselves and one another in all our life to Christ our God, to, to you, you Lord, Lord our God. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us keep silence together. We say together, have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so hope us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Would you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please do share a sign of God's peace with those around you. And peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Saviour and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of, of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your price, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Would you please stand to pray? Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for being us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work that you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him and to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honoured and glory, now and forever. Amen.
May the Father from whom every family in earth and heaven receives its name strengthen you with his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.